working with your own vulnerability and the fear of judgment and criticism, which we come by honestly, especially with ADHD. We were criticized so much more than our non-ADHD counterparts that it is something we have worked so hard to avoid. And so to say like, oh, you just need to lean into the, to the mistake, you know, <laughs> it can feel like parts of you might be like, no way, Jen, that's craziness. So there might be some deeper work there. And another piece of that deeper work may be working with the fear of uncertainty because that is something that's really common for people who have any kind of unresolved wounds or trauma because the thing is when things are predictable, that can feel safe. But the reality is predictability is mostly just an illusion, as is certainty. Hi, I'm Jen Barnes, and you're about to experience how to ditch the old ways of doing things, embrace your neurodivergence, learn tips and tricks to function optimally, and love yourself, neurodivergence and all. Welcome to the Self-Loved Woman Podcast. Hey, it's Jen. I'm so glad you're here. Today, we're going to talk about something really big that a lot of people don't really talk about, and it's curiosity. It's been coming up for me, popping up in different parts of my life. And so it just seems really relevant when that happens. It's like, oh, we're talking about questions here and questions here and curiosity here. And so it seems like a really important topic for the day. So I thought I'd help us process it because it turns out that curiosity is really essential to being able to build a business and continue to help it grow. So let's get into it. This has been popping up for me everywhere, whether it's my main business teacher, mentor, coach person, who I believe this actually comes from Tony Robbins, but he says that the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your questions. And, and then my coach, mentor, teacher person says, yeah, and that applies to your business too. That in our business, it's really important to be asking quality questions to help us build, grow, and improve our business. So it's coming up there. My favorite yoga teacher talked about it in a message she sent out to all of us, her newsletter about living the questions. It's also coming up in this book I'm reading, The One Thing, and I might be saying the title wrong, but by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. And they actually encourage you to ask a question about what's the one thing that you can do today or what's the one thing you can focus on right now to make the most difference. And so this idea of questions is really front and center for me. And a lot of times when people talk about questions like, oh, you need to come up with good questions, what I notice in myself is some tightness, some upset in my belly, and then kind of like sheer panic. As I don't even know what to ask and it feels scary. And I'll talk a little bit about the different times when asking questions has actually been very easy for me. But in this context, especially about business, it can feel really, really hard. And so I got to reflecting on like, where does that come from? And for a lot of us, I think our initial struggle with curiosity and asking questions was school. You know, whether you went to a Catholic school like me where questions from students were definitely not encouraged, especially if they questioned the thing that the teacher or priest or nun was saying, that doesn't make sense kind of a question. But just even in general, like we were supposed to just kind of be obedient, sit there quietly and pay attention. And and that was definitely true in my Catholic school. But when you think about our educational system in America, it came from a time of the Industrial Revolution, when the whole purpose of the public education system was to de develop factory workers, like people who were obedient, didn't question, just did what they were told. And so in a lot of ways, you know, school systems that are still acting that way, or at least were, were functioning that way when we were kids, and most of them still were, killed our curiosity it made it scarier to ask questions. And a lot of times, you know, yeah, kids might make fun of us, but even the teachers would rip on you for asking a question or not understanding something. I mean, I remember some people just being lambasted and I was like, oh my gosh, they just asked a question that they didn't understand. And so struggle with asking questions comes 
for many of us from a very young age. So the thing is, is kids are curious. Like, have you ever noticed how curious they are? One of their favorite words, especially I think once they hit like three, if I remember right, is why, why, why? Like they want to know why. Some of it is probably they want to know why they have to do it. But some of it is they just really are curious. And so I think it's important to consider when does that go away? Like some kids keep it, but a lot of kids lose that curiosity, that ability to question. And how do we nurture that? in the children of the world, because we want people to ask really good questions so that we're actually solving some of the big problems we have in the world that require more than just simple answers. But also we want people to have like good lives and ask the questions they need to get there. And what I came up with is, first of all, and this is probably obvious, but instead of stifling questions or being too busy to answer it, If we can't answer it in that moment because we're busy, say, you know what, that is a really good question. Let's find a way to mark it down because I do want to unpack this with you, but I can't right now, right? Let's put a pin in it. But then you have to come back to it, right? Because you want to teach your kids that's important or teach kids in your life that's important, right? I'm a child-free auntie, so I can do that with my nieces because I don't have children of my own. My cats really don't care when I do that stuff, although I do practice parenting my cats, so there's that. But anyway, I digress. But then when we are ready to hold the space, we let them ask their question and we listen and we say, you know, what about that? Like, what are you wondering? And try and understand what the actual question is they're asking, because sometimes they can be asking a question, but really there's a deeper question beneath it. And so really getting curious about like, oh yeah, what is that? And then asking them questions to help them figure it out rather than just volunteering the answer. And sometimes that might be, how might we figure that out together, right? And I will tell you, I am guilty of just giving the answer sometimes. And if I don't know it, I'll say, hey, look, let's look it up together, you know, whatever. But in there are some times, like kids ask a lot of questions. You can't do this every time. But if every time they ask a question, we just give the answer and never show them how to seek answers for themselves besides just asking an adult, then they never learn how to figure these things out for themselves. So to me, I think it's a balance and I get it. As parents and people with children in your life, you have a very full schedule. So there are going to be times where you just answer the question and you're just over it, right? But it's important that for children, we do take time when we can to help foster that sense of curiosity to hold space for it and to to sit in the silence with them wondering, because that is also what we want to do for ourselves. We want to be able to be curious and to stay open to the possibility of the different options. Because here's the thing, there are often multiple answers to questions, depending on who you ask. First of all, everyone in this country, let alone in the world, has way different life experiences. Everyone's reality is different. Everyone's truth is a little different. And so the answer to certain questions may vary significantly. And it can be very interesting to consider what does that look like for different people? To figure that out, we have to stay open to the fact that there are different experiences. There are different realities. We don't have to like it. We can be uncomfortable about it. But when we close off to that, we're closing off a part of our curiosity, making it harder for us to stay open to the answers that we seek. The other thing is that being able to ask good questions and staying open for the answers is that we have to be open to trial and error, and we have to be open to being wrong. We have to have a willingness to make what I would do air quotes around mistakes, which I actually talk about mistakes as really opportunities for continued learning and growth, right? Like, I don't think mistakes are a bad thing. I think it's just like, oh, this happened. Now what do we need to do? Because that didn't work. And I notice this is incredibly hard for ADHD women. And of course it is. Because like I talk about all the time, we received way more criticism and negative 
feedback and correction than our non-ADHD peers. So a lot of us in attempt to avoid criticism focused on perfectionism and being right versus getting it right because we couldn't handle any more criticism or judgment or even for some of my ADHD friends from my youth, actually, like they felt like they were stupid and that people thought they were stupid, right? So like it, admitting they were wrong or didn't know something made them really vulnerable. And not to mention the shame that could be piled on for not knowing something. You know, I talked about teachers when kids don't know an answer. I remember, gosh, as late as high school, which was in the early 90s, kids being shamed for not getting an answer correct. I remember being shamed myself for not getting an answer correct. And it was like, okay, yeah, if I hadn't tried, that's, I don't think anyone should ever be shamed. It's an ineffective tool that used to be used by grownups, I think still is sometimes to get people to behave a certain way. But the fact of the matter is, is shame is not effective for changing behavior. But like a lot of times it was used when they assumed you didn't do the assignment or whatever. But for me, I always did my homework. So if I didn't, if I got an answer wrong, it meant I didn't understand it. Or I made a mistake and I needed some grace to figure it out rather than shame for getting it wrong. But but that shame that so many of us grew up with has created a culture of it being more important to be right than to get it right. And the problem is, is it's actually more important to get it right than to be right. It's more important to stay open to the life learning, to notice when what we're doing isn't working, to be able to own it and acknowledge it and then pay attention to, oh yeah, this isn't working. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I wonder what else I can do instead. But that requires a certain level of vulnerability that tends to not be very welcome in our society. I mean, it's why Brene Brown was such a big deal because she talked about one of the first things she talked about was the power of vulnerability. And everyone was like, yes, why don't we have this? And and she pointed out, we don't have it because of all the shame we carry. And what's with that is the fear of being shamed, of being criticized and judged and shamed. And even if people don't shame us, we shame ourselves. And so a lot of this ability to ask good questions requires us to first acknowledge that something isn't going as planned. And if you want to call that a mistake, that's fine that you've made a mistake. And then actually admit it, own it, and embrace it and be like, okay, yep, that didn't work. Let's unpack it. Where did it fall apart? But we can't do that if we feel like we're, we need to bury down into this turtle shell because we can't handle the big feelings that come from it, maybe even shame. And this is hard because we live in this black and white society where it's good or bad, right or wrong. And then people attach someone's worth to something they said or did one time that maybe was a mistake. There was recently a fellow ADHD woman entrepreneur who works with other ADHD women entrepreneurs. And, and she came out and said something that was not great. It wasn't that it was bad. It was just inaccurate. And people called her out on it. And I really admired her because she sent out an email and was like, hey, you know what? I misspoke. And this was inaccurate. And here's how I'm going to remedy it. And I don't know if she did it without feeling shame, but she said it without shame. And I was like, this is a person I can get on board with because they're able to notice when they did something that maybe wasn't okay or that was malaligned in some way or that didn't work out as intended. And they were willing to course correct. And that's really what's required for us to do when we own a business, when we're building a business, right? I've been a question asker most of my life, at least as far back as high school, right? And for me, it was about truly understanding as well as I could pay attention better when I was asking questions, right? If I knew I was going to ask a question, I had to pay attention and formulate the question I wanted to ask. But also it helped me learn things because if I asked a question, I would often ask how it related to what I already knew, which was really helping me code it into my memory. I didn't know that at the time I was a child or adolescent, whatever, but that's what I was doing. And 
I'm sure it was annoying. It's not like I was incredibly popular in high school. I, I had few friends and even them I would use air quotes because I don't think they were really friends of mine, even though we spent time together. But anyway, in college, this was less frowned upon, though sometimes people would still find it annoying. They just want to get through the material and leave as quickly as they could. That wasn't why I was there. I have an incredible thirst, almost insatiable hunger for knowledge and understanding. Like I love learning and growth. It's actually one of my top three core values. And so for me, I am so curious about things, especially inside of the process of learning. So that even though sometimes people would roll their eyes because I was asking another question, I didn't care because it was more important to me to actually take in the information and understand and learn and grow. And it turns out in grad school was the first time that I really felt that this was appreciated and in fact, almost honored, I would say. So I was in grad school and for those of you that know my background, you know that my undergraduate degree was in mathematics and statistics with a concentration in actuarial science. So yeah, I worked as an actuarial analyst for almost four years and I came from that world. And so to get into social work grad school, I had to take prerequisites for sure. But, you know, you don't do a full bachelor's in social work to do it. I already had a bachelor's degree. So we were in a class and everyone kept using this word that I had never heard before, milieu. And you might know what that word means. I certainly didn't. And everyone was like, the milieu, they were in the milieu, the milieu, the milieu. And it was like every other word. And I was like, what the heck is milieu? And it came up over the course of a class, maybe two, to the point where I finally was like, I have a question. And the professor was like, sure, Jen, what's up? And I was like, what's milieu? And this, mind you, was long before cell phones. Could you Google anything on them or look it up? They didn't, smartphones weren't around yet. I don't even know. I think I had my Palm Pilot by then, but like, that was about it. And so I couldn't just look it up on my phone in class. And so I asked and, you know, there were some kind of snickers or whatever from the class, but he was like, you know what, that is a great question. And I appreciate you being courageous enough to ask. And he celebrated that courage that to me, it was more important to understand and learn than it was to look foolish. And he said, like, you don't actually look foolish to me. You have a degree in math. Of course, you don't know what the word milieu means. And he, I mean, of course, he explained it to me, which for those of you who don't know, milieu is kind of like the environment, right? And a lot of times in social work, people would use it in terms of like the milieu. So in a lot of community mental health centers, there'll be like a almost like a drop-in center aspect to part of it where they have like groups and I don't know, activities and stuff. And so they'll call that the milieu. So I was like, oh, okay, that's easy enough to understand. But it felt really cool to have someone recognize that it took courage to do that. Because asking questions takes courage. We make ourselves vulnerable when we admit we don't know something. And yeah, that was publicly admitting I didn't know something, and it was a risk that way. But even inside of ourselves, with all of our parts, some of whom hold voices of people from our past, maybe even who are still in our present, who criticize us or judge us or shame us when we say something that they think is stupid or ask a question that they think we should know, it can be hard to even ask those questions of ourselves. And so because of all this, excuse me, but old garbage that we carry with us from the past, right? We come by it honestly, but it was just piled on us. It can be really hard to even know what questions to ask. But the thing is, if the quality of our life is determined by the quality of our questions, and then the quality of our business is determined by the quality of our questions, then it seems like something we probably should figure out. And I have figured out more and more how to do that, even with all these other things that have happened. And sure, some of it has been like healing the old wounds and recognizing the people who shamed me or whatever. But then also a piece of it has just been like being in the present around it. And when that old stuff comes up, be like, oh, yeah, I see you. Yeah, you hold that from back then and trying to remind the parts of myself so you can remind the parts of yourself that like, oh, that was then. 
this is now and now I'm okay. Now I can do this. And if you don't feel like you're okay now, then there's some deeper inner work for you to do, right? But there's two ways to find out what it is you need to be asking yourself. There's probably more than two ways, but the two ways that I found are effective for me is one, to pay attention. Like you're not going to notice that there's even a question to ask if you're not paying attention to even notice that something didn't go well, but you're also not going to have any idea where to start if you're not paying attention. And two is having awareness. And those are really almost the same thing, but slightly different. But having awareness of your own experiences and the experiences of others is very, very important. And we want to pay attention to that. And we can improve both our ability to pay attention and focus our attention, even with ADHD, as well as improve our awareness through specific practices we can do. We can do mindfulness practices that involve movement. Things like mindful toothbrushing. So you could mindfully brush your teeth. You could practice yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong. Seated meditation is a great way to increase your ability to focus, pay attention, and increase your awareness. As is sitting in silence. There's a, a practice I learned from one of my yoga teachers back in the day called bhavana. And the idea is that you read a piece of yoga scripture, right? So a yoga text, like could be the Upanishads, could be the Bhagavad Gita, could be the Yoga Sutras. It doesn't matter. You could probably do it with whatever text is meaningful to you. So if you're like, I don't like any of those, that, that clashes with me, you could probably do it with the Bible. You could probably do it with some kind of text on nature. You could do it with braiding sweet grass. But basically the idea is you read something from it and then you sit in silence with it, essentially silent meditation. And you let yourself sit with it and just let it be in your head. And sure, with ADHD, I mean, like there's a lot of thoughts at first, <laughs> but eventually it settles. And after, if you can do it 20 minutes, things settle a lot after 20 minutes. But even if you can only do 10 and then grab a pen and a journal and just free write whatever comes up. Don't worry about finishing your sentences. Don't worry about penmanship or grammar or any of that, but just free write and notice what comes up for you. I find that is one of the best ways that I get the questions I need to ask and oftentimes the answers or at least the answer for right now around the thing that I'm going to try next because of whatever just happened that was ineffective or in some way didn't work out as expected. But the thing is, this is the what to do, but it requires courage to ask. And it means that you have to find some way to get at least comfortable enough with mistakes or those things that don't go as planned that you can learn from so that you can sit with them and not go into a shame spiral. Or as Brene Brown says, shame shit storm, right? It requires you to shift to seeing your business and your life as an experiment. Like, all right, well, I'm going to try this next. See how that goes. And sometimes that's easier said than done because sometimes things are very painful. And sometimes we're less intentional about it being an experiment. So then when it goes wrong, we're like, well, I wasn't even experimenting. But the thing is, is you always are. No one exactly knows ex like what you're supposed to be doing at every minute of every day to do well in anything in this lifetime. And the reason I can say that with certainty is, <laughs> and there's so much lack of uncertainty in our life is because of it. Things change so rapidly. Nothing is ever exactly the same as it was before. You may have found some things that help you right now, and that's great. But a lot of times there will be a need for things to shift and change and follow whatever is happening now. But that requires you to be able to be an experimenter and to get comfortable with when things don't go your way instead of spiraling down and being completely unable to function for several days or even weeks. Another piece of this is working with your own vulnerability and the fear of judgment and criticism, which we come by honestly, especially with ADHD. We were criticized so much more than our non-ADHD counterparts that it is something we have worked so hard to avoid. And so to say like, oh, you just need to lean into the, to the mistake, you know, <laughs> it can feel like 
parts of you might be like, no way, Jen, that's craziness. So there might be some deeper work there. And another piece of that deeper work may be working with the fear of uncertainty because that is something that's really common for people who have any kind of unresolved wounds or trauma. Because the thing is, when things are predictable, that can feel safe. But the reality is predictability is mostly just an illusion, as is certainty. Most things are uncertain. We just have to pretend they're certain and predictable so that we can function every day, or at least have to not worry about them being unpredictable so we can function every day. And again, there may be some deeper work there. And if you're like, hey, you know what? I would love to do that deeper work with you. I would love to work through some of these underlying things that are going on. I'm really excited to share that I am opening up the priority notification list for my upcoming three-part live event, How to Overcome Invisible Obstacles of ADHD So You Can Build a Prosperous, Meaningful Business You Love. And that training is coming back around at the beginning of August. So if you're interested, you can get all signed up right now to be on the priority notification list. So you'll be among the first notified. And in the meantime, you'll get all the like regular email club goodies that I send out, plus maybe some extra bonuses for those people who signed up for the priority notification list. So the info for that is in the show notes. And Even if you decide not to do that, which by the way, I highly recommend it's entirely free, I would encourage you to find a way to sit with the questions, to sit with your curiosity and to continue to cultivate it, whether that's trying the bhavana practice I mentioned, or just even free writing in general, or just seriously paying attention more and being like, huh, I wonder what that's about right? Or even when someone says something as though it's certain fact, at least in your mind saying, hmm, I wonder what makes them say that. All right, y'all, this has been a fun one, delving into our questions and curiosity. I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. (music) 